So, end of the break. Uh, our uh, next speaker will be Johannes Wax from Germany. Uh, Johannes Wax uh, is a PhD student at the Center for Network Science at Central European University. He's also affiliated with the Corruption Research Center in Budapest. And he was uh, a consultant for Bond Weaver, uh, a network science consultant. Um, so now let's start the talk, analyzing networks in Python. So give him applause. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, also, thank you for your participation in the, the survey and the, the poll, which is still active. Feel free to jump in on that. Um, I see that the vast majority of you have not ever used NetworkX before, which is great. Um, so let me get right into it. First, who am I? Um, I was just introduced, so I'll do this quickly, but I'm a PhD student again at cent uh, the Center for Network Science at CU in Budapest. Um, it's a great PhD program. If you're interested in the kind of things I'm talking about today, please find me and figure out how uh, we can work together, how you might be able to join our PhD program. There was great funding available, so please get in touch with me. I'm also a researcher at the Government Transparency Institute, which is an NGO. I'm an occasional consultant and freelancer on the side using this kind of, these kinds of methods. And um, most importantly for this conference, I'm a Python and Network X user in all of these roles. So first, I have to motivate a little bit uh, why networks. So for me, networks are an excellent framework to study complexity in data. So uh, very, we ha you always hear about how much data we have these days, but almost always it's, um, it's in this kind of row form, and that's how it's analyzed as well. And I hope that in the course of this talk, you'll see that this network perspective is very useful. So here's... Um, Another reason why networks are so interesting, you have these great pictures. This is a uh, friendship network of an American high school. These are all 13-year-olds. Uh, this is a, a sociologist did this study in 2001. And can anyone guess what the colors of the nodes represent? So the nodes are individual 13-year-olds, and the links between them indicate friendship. What, are, what do the colors mean? Gender, sex, race. race. So the yellow nodes are white students, the uh, green nodes are African-American students, the red nodes are students of mixed race, and uh, you see immediately a, a big story. You also see uh, gender in this, actually. Within the two groups, you see a split, and that's gender. And that is maybe not so surprising for 13-year-olds. Um, and so that, that's on the social science end. Now this is the hard science uh, type result. And this uh, actually, I think, has a nice uh, follow-up to Daniela's talk just a few mo moments ago, talking about emergent properties in the brain. Um, this is somehow a mapping of the brain and how it functions into a network. And um, maybe it's not so uh, jarring an image as the social network on the previous slide, but there are significant differences. And this is one way we hope to understand how does uh, an autistic brain differ from uh, another brain? So those are some motivational examples and some quick terminologies to get everyone on the same page. So graphs have two components, nodes and edges connecting them. Edges can either be directed or undirected. The way I always uh, explain this is that on Twitter, I can follow Barack Obama. That doesn't mean he follows me. But on Facebook, if I friend Barack Obama and he accepts, then we are symmetric friends. And uh, how do you deal with networks in Python? There are a few options, but I think the best one out there, uh, my favorite, the one I use almost every day, is a library called NetworkX. And here's the home page. Um, let me read their own introduction. So NetworkX is a Python library, uh, is a Python language software package for the creation, manipulation, and study of the structure, dynamics, and functions of complex networks. So um, what's the story? It was made at Los, uh, Los Alamos, uh, the, uh, the labs there, in 2005. It's very close to the Santa Fe Institute, which if you're in interested in complex systems, um, you, you know why there would be a connection. 
and what are the goals? The goals that they state are they want to provide tools to study networks. They want to f uh, provide a standard inter interface suitable for many projects. Uh, they care about rapid development for collaborative multidisciplinary projects, as we saw the two examples from very different disciplines. Um, they want to interface to uh, lower level languages for the speed, obviously. And they want uh, to ease in this big data world, the, to ease the process of taking in and we'll see also exporting different kinds of data sets. Basics, how does it work? Well, we import network X as NX, that's the, the uh, custom. We create an empty graph and then we add nodes. So we add a node Janos. We can also add nodes from containers like lists. So we add Sof Sophie and Otto. We add an edge from Janos to Sophie and we can also add edges from containers. Nice and easy. What does this look like? In the IPython notebook, you can plot these things. The plotting is on, map, is on top of matplotlib. It's not great. Most of the visualizations I'll show you later um, require external software, but that's more because uh, graphic visualization is a very, very difficult uh, task. What about with directed graphs? Well, then the only thing you have to do is initialize your graph as a digraph or directed graph. And you have to take care that when you add edges, um, the uh, order of the tuples matters. So here I've changed the edges and you see in the visualization little arrows pointing in the direction. And uh, actually we've done something that we don't need to do. You can just add edges and network X inte intelligently adds nodes uh, if they're not already in your graph. <clears throat> so what can nodes be? Nodes can be really anything, any hashable object in Python. They can be strings, floats, they can even be functions and files. So here I've um, added a node, the numpy mean function. That is a node in the graph now. And I can also add uh, files as nodes. And both edges and nodes have um, uh, the ability to store attributes in dictionary form. So really you can, you can create networks out of any kind of data you can imagine. Um, so in the previous slides, we were adding nodes one by one and ad adding edges one by one, typing them in. That's usually not how we do it, of course. Um, and thankfully, Network X handles the following and more very, very well. So you can take in standard files like TXTs, CSVs, JSONs, uh, specific graphs uh, from other programs, graph formats like GML and uh, uh, GEXF. And finally, from Python objects like dictionaries, pandas, data frames, lists of lists, etc. Really, there is um, excellent coverage for this. Here's a quick example. So I have. Um, um, a TXT file, which is a, a weighted directed um, format. So it means node one has an edge to node 463 with weight one, and so on. Um, it's a one line to read this in and to create it and to declare it as a directed graph. And you see uh, this, this is practically instant and you have your, you have your network ready to go. So um, for the rest of the talk, I'll present a few case studies about how, uh, how I use these libraries. So the first one um, is from my job as a consultant sometimes. Uh, it has to do with collaboration and expertise in a firm. So a 300-person company wanted to know how their, empl uh, how their experts were collaborating um, and how experts were distributed and uh, they really wanted to see the network structure of this. And what we did is we surveyed em employees to find uh, co collaborations between employees and expertise. And uh, let me make a quick note here. You don't ask your employees who are the experts or who do you collaborate with. So there's a, a big amount of sociometry or in psychology that goes into these, re these kinds of survey questions. Anyway, we have two kinds of graphs. We have the graph, uh, or two graphs in this data. The graph of coll collaboration relationships and the graph of expertise nominations. And from this we create some simple indicators or, or features. Uh, we take the collaboration graph's uh, density. Um, we take, uh, and then we generate an expertise score for nodes using PageRank on the expertise graph. PageRank is um, basically how Google became, how Google won the search engine wars. Um, and then we also calculate the average distance from expertise in the expertise graph. And here are the results. This is what it looks like. We see large cluster of, of collaborating employees without any direct ex access to expertise on the periphery. So the large nodes are the experts, 
the um, edges are connecting people with a collaboration relationship. And then we have, in pink and red, the managers, it's two tiers, and black are the uh, employees. And from this single picture, and of course, the data underlying it that we provide in the process of making this visualization gives the firm a lot of interesting things. You can see, uh, you can tell a lot of interesting stories from just this picture. <clears throat> Second case study, um, a guy who's in the news. I made this slide uh, a year ago. I thought it would be a throwaway slide, <laughs> but uh, he's stuck with us, I guess. Um, so for better or for worse, Twitter has become a major platform for politics. Um, scraping tr tweets from uh, the service, from the, from the API, we see how followers of different parties talk with each other around election time. Um, this is a social scientific question, and you can answer a lot of hypotheses in interesting ways doing this. A network show us the big picture. For example, do, uh, do people on the left and right ever talk with each other directly anymore? Um, and the specific case is uh, Denmark in 2015. Um, there are 10 major parties, conveniently five on the left, five on the right. Uh, there are about 100,000 accounts that follow these parties. And we took uh, over 5 million tweets from just before the campaign, during the campaign, and for a little while after the government was formed. We analyzed all the tweets using a library called AFIN, also in Python. And uh, here's the most negative tweet during the campaign. Uh, once Danish politics was a battle between evil and stupid. Now it's the evil and stupid against some other evil and stupid. And the hashtag uh, stemblankt, I believe, means uh, blank ballot. So this guy's going to vote for no, none of the above. And here's a quick visualization of the network. So what's the network here? You could say there's a following network, but uh, this is a visualization of who tweets at whom. And we see that there is a big clump of people on the top who follow only parties on the left. There's a smaller, sparser, similar group on the bottom of people who only follow parties on the right. Most people follow, most people are in the center following some of both parties. But we see that on the, on the ends, there's a high amount of kind of segregation. Although there are a few uh, brave conservatives or per perhaps trolls bothering the guys on the left and the top. This is what the average sentiment looks like over time. We split it into three groups. Um, the first dotted line is when the uh, incumbent prime minister called new elections. The second dotted line is the date of the elections. And can anyone guess who won the election from the sentiment of, the, of their tweets? Was it the left, center, or right? Or let me just say left or right. Sorry? Anyone? Anyway, the, the right won. You see, they, um, during the campaign, they became extremely negative. And then uh, as soon as the election was won, they shot up. This is the biggest movement in this thing. And the left and the center, uh, over time, kind of were disappointed with the results. Anyway, this is, uh, this is the kind of row, data, row type data I was talking about. This is plotting a time series of average sentiments. But uh, how does the networks change? How does the structure of communication in this online world change? Well, using the uh, triadic census function in Network X, um, we see these immersion motifs. Um, during the campaign, we have these, uh, these first two motifs with uh, a lot less back and forth, a lot, a lot less reciprocation, and kind of these one-off things that you can imagine are people saying bad things about each other. And underrepresented during, during the campaign are exactly the motifs where you have a conversation and dialogue between people. And indeed, we see that the average sentiment during the, uh, in the three periods of tweets from a left account to a right account, and from a right account to a left account, there's a dip. There's a significant dip. And under the hood here is a lot of uh, statistics and doing this the rigorous way. Um, but I can assure you that this is, this is an observable phenomenon where the ingredients are simple individuals tweeting at each other, and there's an emergence of real structure that's interesting to analyze. So the f uh, last study I wanted to talk about today was uh, corruption in public contracting. Um, so 
public contracting is, uh, makes up upwards of 25% of GDP in European uh, EU countries. And this is a major avenue for corruption. If you believe that corruption is a problem in politics, this is one of the largest channels of money from the public purse into private hands. And so clearly there's a lot of risk here. My colleagues and I, we developed a corruption risk index. And this is a contract level score that all it does is tracks uh, the presence of red flags on individual contracts. So again, this is contract level. Um, basically the way public contracting should work is that the, uh, uh, a public hospital wants to buy beds. They want to buy 100 new beds. They should invite uh, bids from firms to deliver these beds, uh, these beds, and then they award the contract to the lowest, uh, the lowest price offer. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen in practice, and there are many ways to, to, to rig the process to guide the contract to your, uh, to your friends um, at a higher price. And the CRI tracks exactly this phenomenon. And some examples of its components that we've collected for uh, all contracts include, uh, if the, is there a short bidding time? So basically, if you're the uh, person issuing the uh, contract, you tell your friends from ahead of time, and they have a lot of time to prepare and then you give everybody else just a few days. Um, another example is the presence of dummy bids. So if you've already rigged the contract and you, don't, you want to avoid the scrutiny of the regulator, you create um, fake companies that bid on your contract, and we can detect these. Finally, another example is uh, overdetermination of requirements. So to deliver these hospital beds or to win this hospital bed contract, you had to have uh, delivered us hospital beds in the past. This is something that happens. Um, now the question is, how is CRI distributed in the market of issuers and firms? Um, how do we represent this as a market? Well, we can represent uh, as a network. We can represent each market as a bipartite network of winners and issuers. And they're connected by an edge if there's a contracting relationship. And uh, network X dot bipartite is a whole module of functions tailored specifically for bipartite graphs. They're very nuanced, and they have their own algorithms and best practices. So you need to you need to be very careful. But Network X does a lot of the work for you. And again, we ask the question: Do patterns emerge? Here is the uh, most of the Hungarian uh, consulting services market in 2009. Uh, so the nodes are firms and issuers, and the edges connect them if they have a contracting relationship in this period. And to make a very simple uh, the darker red, the more suspicious the contracts are. We see the Hungarian Post was involved in something suspicious. It turns out in 2009 they had an outsourcing program um, where they uh, basically took the centralized post offices in the medium-sized cities in Hungary and outsourced a lot of the, the uh, delivery work and work with the villages surrounding them to companies. And this was basically a, hand, a, a huge handout. Um, to corrupt interests. They also bought uh, bicycles for all of their, uh, for many of their delivery people, and the average cost of a bicycle was about a thousand euros. And I can promise you that these are not nice bicycles. These are not f uh, fancy top of the line bikes, but nevertheless, they cost a thousand euros a piece. So um, you also see the Budapest city government making an appearance here, which for Hungarians, um, I don't know if there are any in the audience, is probably. Not a big surprise. Um, one thing I found funny was one of the firms winning a contract, a consulting services contract, from an arm of the Budapest city government was a local Tai Chi association. Anyway, make of it, make of that what you will. Um, uh, to conclude, there are some uh, alternatives to Network X. So I've done all the work in those three case studies entirely in Network X. But if you need some more power, if you have larger networks, um, if you know anything, if, if you have some computer science background and you know how, com how the complexity of some of these uh, uh, graph algorithms, uh, you know that as soon as you have bigger networks, you need very powerful tools and very quickly you need approximation and you run into intractable problems. There are two great alternatives that you can access via Python. The first is iGraph, but uh, the absolute fastest is GraphTool. And uh, I highly recommend you look at these two and Network X. And uh, actually, that's all I wanted to say. So thanks a lot.
So uh, let's now proceed with questions. I think the first one is a bit provocative. Uh, is the CRI algorithm open source? I think Slovakia could use it. <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, actually, the the CRI is in develop. It's um, it's basically the product of a PhD thesis of my my colleague uh, Mihai Fazekas. He's a postdoc in Cambridge right now, and actually he started in Hungary, but. We have data from 2009 to 2012 for Hungary, Slovakia, and Czech Republic. I actually debated coming up with a Slovakian case, but I felt it was maybe too political. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think a very famous example a few years ago was the so-called uh, notice board scandal. It's something like there was, a, there was a huge contract for some kind of thing, and they posted the call for bids uh, in a ministry behind a locked door for a couple of days. And of course, one firm bid and won the big prize. Uh, the point is, uh, this data with the CRI is available uh, at uh, digiwist.eu. It's a, a Horizon 2020, so EU-funded uh, project for uh, open data in uh, in the European Union on the government side, on the public sector. Um, and we have this data set on Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic uh, available for download. So please, please go have a look at that. And the other work that DigiWist does, they, they do great work. Uh, Digiwist.eu, so short for digital whistleblower. And if you, if you can't find it or you have any specific questions, please find me at lunch or in the next couple hours. Okay, uh, next one. Can you, uh, can you suggest a non-commercial, production-ready, and having good Python lib to work with graph database, not Neo4j? Cheers. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, I've, I've only used Neo4j a few times, and I, I, I'm not an expert in graph databases, so sorry. Um, does Network X allow me to create network infrastructure map easily, example in combination with Nmap? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I can't, uh, sorry to disappoint again, but I, I'm not familiar with Nmap. But I, I think um, Network X is extremely flexible, and so I would be surprised that uh, if there was some incompatibility. But uh, whoever asked, please, we can go through it together. We can figure it out. Okay, next one. Can you compare bulk flow and network X? Uh, sorry, again, I do not know. I'm not familiar with bulk flow, so sorry. Again, at lunch, please reach out to me. You are pretty fast with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> what do I you think about iGraph library? Uh, why do you prefer network X? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think I have call, the, the guy who sits next to me, he is a diehard iGraph. He, he likes it much better. He calls me an idiot for using NetworkX every day. And he's right that it's, it's faster and it has some more uh, powers. But I think NetworkX for me is easier, it's easier to prototype things. You click on the, the source code and it's written in, in pure Python. And you can, for me, it's much, much easier to, to modify the algorithms, which in practice, um, you wind up doing a lot. I'm sure an iGraph expert would say, no, no, iGraph is also very easy to, to tweak. But uh, for me, I just learned how to do it in Network X, and it, it's, it's very intuitive for me. To, to give a very quick example, imagine you have a graph algorithm, uh, a very complicated graph algorithm that isn't implemented for weighted graphs, so graphs with um, weights on the edges. Um, you have the Python implementation of, you have the Network X implementation of the algorithm for unweighted graphs, um, probably it will be very easy to take a copy of it, to modify it, tweak it a bit, and have, have what you need up and running quickly. 